One of the most perplexing cases I've examined involves a hunter named Thomas Messick, who in 2015 went missing in Northeast New York. For people who don't know, the FBI doesn't investigate missing adults. There's a subcategory for the FBI that they can become involved in the disappearance of extremely young children under a certain set of criteria. So the million dollar question is, why would the FBI arrive on Tom Messick's case? He loved the outdoors. He loved being in the woods. Hunting and fishing was his life. You want a cookie, honey? Huh? He was a very good husband, very good father. And I don't think you will find anybody who ever met him who didn't like him. And how many kids did you guys have? We had three sons, Tommy, Gene, and Rob. So tell me about your dad. What kind of guy was he? Uh, it's kind of do what you got to do to get things done. Never had a contractor in the house. We always did everything, you name it. I mean, we lifted the house up and put a foundation under it. When I was digging it out, I looked up at him. He had a cup of coffee in his hand, and I said, why don't we get a backhoe? And he said, I have one right there. <laughs> What did you guys like to do as a family? We camped. We did a lot of camping. And the boys loved it. And, you know, I was kind of the outsider because they were boys. And they, they hunted and fished and did those things. I knew Tom before we were in the hunt camp because he used to work in Norton with me. I knew him probably about 55 years, somewhere around there. What'd you guys like to do together? Hunt, hunt and fish. It's what we done all the time, really. We used to travel together with our kids yeah. for years. <laughs> yeah, we both, we had trailers, in which we used to go trailing all the time, who come to think of it. We all got the same vacation at Norton, so we all took off and went to Saranac, different places like that. You know? So what was your introduction to the outdoors? Uh, it was always there. Because my father always hunted and fished. We got a camp up, up north, not far from uh, Brant Lake, for about a week every year. A bunch of guys get together and go hunting. He taught hunter training for a long, long time. He probably taught every one of the kids around here. Tom was a great guy. He was an old airborne ranger. He was unbelievable in the woods. Uh, he taught my hunting class for me to get my hunting, hunting license. He taught survival. He had gunpowder blow up in his face, and that's how he was. He had like 159 stitches in his hand, and he lost his eye that way. So he would say to these kids, this is what happens if you're not careful. I mean, he had a lot of issues over the years, but Never really seemed to slow him down any. So, so obviously he had one eye. Yeah, he was sort of blind. It wasn't really that great, but he could actually see out of it. And hearing, there was an issue. Yeah, it wasn't that great with the hearing. Hearing needed hearing aids. Would Tom be the kind of guy that would drink a lot, or no, no, he didn't drink that much. No. So the day when you guys went hunting, did you guys drink when you hunt? No, no, no. We might have beer with us in the truck. When we come out of the woods, we always might have a beer or something like that. But other than that, nothing excessive, you know? How would you describe your dad's judgment? He was good. In fact, he was probably one of his better days I've seen in a long time. He was good spirits and moving great. Didn't seem to even have an ache or pain in him that day. He was moving good.
how often do you think about it? Oh, I think about it quite often. You know, always pops into your mind. We were doing just kind of a quick thing. Uh, it was late, actually late, uh, almost lunchtime by the time we ended up going up there. Kind of a, just a two hour thing until evening and we were gonna go back to camp and hunt around camp until dark. How many guys went up there that day? Seven. Someone made the decision to hunt over by Brant Lake. Who made that decision? I did. I just mentioned that we had state land there. We kind of agreed to hunt it. The road's a lowly pond. I mean, you go up that road straight to the lake we parked right at the lake and uh, the old guys literally walked down that road in 100 yard increments we walked in 30 40 yards at the most and sat down Al was the first watcher I was the second Joe Capicelli, and then Tom. So Tom was furthest from the lake? He was the furthest one. We followed the trail on the lake, come up that snowmobile trail, popped into the woods and swung up to him, a slow hunting drive type thing. The young boys said to the old man, you four sit here, and if we see any deer, we'll push them towards you. And if Tom was a watcher, Tom would not have moved. I know that for a fact. If he was a watcher, that's where he was. Did you see any deer? No, no. No. Did you hear anything? I heard a strange noise in the woods, but I don't know what it was. It was a different noise than what I usually hear, you know? Like what? Uh, it's even hard to explain because, but it was different. Something different than I'd never heard before and it was, uh, I just can't say what it was, you know? That How hurt. long in duration was it? Was it two or three seconds? No, it's just that, whatever it is, you know? Mm. Hmm. How far away was it? I'd say it's probably a hundred 50 yards, something like that. Was it toward Tom or away from Tom? No, this was up towards the hill, top of the hill, yeah. Did you tell the cops this? Yeah, I told them that, but that, they just passed it off, yeah. The report said that your dad was carrying a walkie-talkie. Yeah. Who else had one? We all did. All on the same channel? Yep. Anybody ever hear anything? No. Did your dad know how to use it? Yep. Tom, Tom, you around? It's one of those things where, you know, he should have been out by now. Call him, call him. You know, he uh -huh. should have been on the, sitting on the watch. Can you hear me? Call her back. If you and then we went and started looking for him. Never know, you might see something. That too. Anybody fire any shots? Oh! Yep, yeah, we fired shots. Somebody went down and called the rangers and then we just kept looking. They stayed overnight at the truck, beeping the horn, firing shots, different things. Robbie called me that night and said, Daddy's missing in the woods, but don't worry, we'll find him. And I said, I'm coming up. 
And he said, no, no, don't come up. I'm sure we're going to find them, and uh, I'll call you. The community is very close-knit. Everybody's pretty much grown up together and knows everybody. You know, it's mountainous, we have lakes, we've got lots of opportunities to enjoy yourself. There's not a lot of pressure here. I came into work one morning and um, I noticed a state police helicopter um, had landed in our ball field right here behind the town hall. And, uh, and then I could see some rangers arranging um, in our parking lot, their vehicles and different apparatus. And I questioned uh, what was going on and they said there was a hunter that had been missing. We did note that when we were up there, it seemed to be devoid of uh, wildlife. You know, we didn't see squirrels, chipmunks, deer, um, any signs of them. How unusual is that for your mountains out here? Um, thought it was strange. Like I said, we didn't see any signs of anything out there. And how many people did Warren County commit? We had our emergency response team up there, which is comprised of 13 team members. So when you heard about it, what'd you do? Go up there, join the search. And I figured it would be go up there and we'll find them and it'd be over, you know. The Air National Guard was going over with uh, infrared. State police had helicopters with a guy out. You walk through the woods, no matter how thick they were, you had to see the other guy's ankle. We went through some terrain you just wouldn't believe, swamps up to your chest, and we covered every bit of it. They were thinking maybe he got to a road and got hit by a car. And uh, so they checked on the sides of the roads and never found anything. The first couple days, I thought for sure we were gonna find him. After about the third or fourth, I said, boy, this ain't good. A mile out, we were still meeting away. Walking through the woods, you trip over somebody, never mind not see him. They would have what they called bump lines, lines that they would run through the uh, forest and we knew that was like a start and a stop. The guy in the end had a roll of string and would tie it to a tree and just keep walking. And when we were done with that grid, they'd tie it off and everybody would shift to the other side and walk back. So you know that between this string line, this string line, and between your bump lines, that area has been covered. A few days later, we went back to the same areas and did them the other way. I mean, we covered every inch of ground up there. The immediate area Look like a spider web because not only did they go this way, they went this way, and they went that way. And so there was string everywhere. You know, 300 people in there one day. People asked who he was, like, was he the governor's brother or something? <laughs> it, it was incredible. How many jurisdictions do you think responded to this search? There was probably a dozen or so volunteer fire departments that had members here, probably 50 or 60 all together in different organizations. That's huge. Yeah. New York State Corrections came out. They searched with their dogs. There's tons of volunteer search and rescue teams that came out with their canine units. I mean, they hit, I guess, for a little while, but for not very long. Day two that we were involved with the search up there, it rained heavily all day. Obviously, an animal didn't get torn up because there'd be a big scatter. There'd be a huge, you know, his clothes be ripped up, stuff be spread all over, it'd be easy to find. Not even a candy wrapper. Not that my husband would throw out a candy wrapper, because he wouldn't. That'd be in his pocket. But nothing, not, not the walkie-talkie, not his gun. They never found anything. You would think that you'd find some trace if somebody was there, um, especially a weapon, because a weapon's not gonna disappear. It's not going to blow away. The FBI, according to their protocol, doesn't search for missing people. So do you understand why they were there? I remember they were there. I thought they were there to provide some sort of uh, technological support, but I don't didn't have any contact with them myself. Hmm. Have you ever had them on a search that you've done? No. 
You had a conversation with the FBI up in Horicon. Mm -hmm. What did they tell you? They said that basically they were there to tell me that he, he now is considered a missing person. And they felt that something was definitely not right, but unless and until they made a recovery, they wouldn't know what it was. That was it. That's basically what they said. In the middle of the Adirondacks, where an elderly man disappears, two agents suddenly show up. They made their way up to Lily Pond Road and they started to monitor this incident. Every time an FBI agent arrives at a scene and is stating that they're monitoring it, they're taking notes and they're writing reports. And those reports go to the behavioral analysts in Virginia. And what their job is, is to look for other cases that match the profile that they're writing about. I think they get it. I think they understand. And maybe they're trying to put the pieces together just as we are. I kind of like to know what happened, but I don't think we ever will. Even if they found them, we wouldn't know what happened. I mean, something odd happened, obviously. We just don't know what. I was there until 11 days. And then I finally said to my oldest son, um, I can't sit here anymore, I gotta go home. Uh, we came back, uh, I think for Thanksgiving, that's why we stopped. We were down to just me and some rangers and a couple other guys, that was it by the time it was over. Well, he's such a sweet dog. He sits in my kitchen window all day long. He sits there and he waits for time to come back. If you go by my house, just see the dog in the window. Did your dad tell you about a sound he heard in the woods that day? He said he heard some kind of snapping or crack sound that was strange. It wasn't something he normally hears in the woods. He still talks to me about it. I don't know. He almost said it sounded like a, like a big trap closing or something. I, I, I don't know, you know. Anything that you think that the audience should know about your dad or about this incident? I'll tell you, you really do never know. I mean, they always say you should go in prepared. I mean, we treated that hunt like I was walking out here in the backyard. It was really nothing. You just, you just don't expect it. An interesting side note to the disappearance of Tom Messick is the case of Fred Drum. About the 10th day of Tom Messick's search, the Department of Conservation Rangers for the state of New York were pulled off of that event and sent 40 miles south to Schulerville, New York. Fred lived on his rural farm with his wife. Fred was a retired supervisor from his town, was an outdoorsman. On Thanksgiving day of 2015, Mrs. Drum went to attend a banquet, and when she returned in the afternoon, her husband wasn't there. His car was there, all of his belongings were in the house, but he had simply vanished. There were helicopters, canines. It was a huge, huge SAR. And the eventual outcome was the same as Tom's. It's quite a coincidence that two elderly men, both hunters, disappeared from a rural area, weren't found, and both have been just chalked up to disappearing. The thing that connects in cases are the profile points. 
And these have been gleaned after reading thousands of cases and seeing them come up time after time and realizing that they are part of the underlying story of each of these incidents. If the victim is with others and decides to move away from them and be on their own, that's the point in time something happens and the victim disappears. We call this the point of separation. The most common time for a victim to disappear is in the mid to late afternoon hours. Granite boulders and rock fields. Victims are often found to disappear in the areas of granite or rock fields. Victims found are disappearing near water. This is a very common trait and one that happens anywhere in the world and isn't isolated to a geographical area. There appears to be a weather incident in close proximity to the time that the person disappears or when the search starts. The weather issue can be anywhere from a dust storm to a full-blown blizzard. Disability or illness. Oftentimes, the victim is later found to have either an obvious or a very subliminal disability or illness. Canines can't find a scent or lose a scent quickly. This is an extremely common profile point that's probably in 95% of all the cases that have been documented. This isn't an indictment of search and rescue, but for some unknown reason, the victims are found in an area that had been searched maybe dozens of times. Clothes, shoes removed. A common trait is that the victims are missing clothing or shoes at the time they're found. Unknown cause of death. If the victim is found, and when they go through a medical examination, the coroners can't determine a cause of death. And finally, clusters. There's a geographical clustering effect to the victims that fit the missing profile. There can be anywhere from three to 70 or 80 people in each geographical cluster. <laughs>